Kelly uses the character of Adam to explore the root cause of human savagery. Adam only appears on stage in Act 3, Scene 3, but is referenced throughout the play. He's an outsider, described by Mark in Act 1, Scene 3, as sort of hanging around. Later, Leah reminds Phil how Adam used to have that cheap ice cream and we used to take the piss. Adam, it seems, wants to be accepted into the group, but is looked down upon by the others. In Act 1, Scene 3, Mark explains what happened to Adam. The group made him eat leaves, burn his socks and steal vodka. They punched him repeatedly in the face, stubbed out cigarettes on him and made him run across the motorway. The group took Adam to a deep shaft with a metal grill over it. They made him walk across it, then threw stones at Adam until he fell into the shaft and presumably died. However, spoiler alert, we later learn that Adam did not die. He sustained a head injury, but survived. He appears in Act 3, Scene 3, found by Kathy living in a hedge which he has to crawl into. Kathy describes it as being like a warren. A warren is a set of interconnecting rabbit burrows. Moments later, Adam explains that he has survived on a diet of insects, grass, leaves... Kelly's use of animal imagery indicates how Adam has lost some of his civilised human behaviour and links to Darwinian theory. In 1859, Charles Darwin published his work on the origin of species, in which he detailed his theory of biological evolution. In The Descent of Man, 1871, Darwin suggested that apes and humans may have a common ancestor. The question raised here is if people have evolved from animals, is it possible to devolve back into an animalistic state? Is there always an animal within us? With Adam, the time he's had away from civilization seems to have resulted in him becoming animalistic. Of course, this is probably because of the head injury he sustained, but the symbolic link to Darwin is also clearly evident. In an earlier video, we explored how the play suggests that without civilization, we devolve into primitive animalistic states, and that certainly fits for Adam. He lives and eats like an animal. He also seems to have lost some of his ability to communicate, seen when Leah says, Hello Adam, how are you? To which Kelly's use of ellipsis indicates Adam's failure to respond. If spoken language is one of the main things that makes us distinctly human, Adam has devolved into an almost subhuman state. Through Adam, then, we see the idea that if humans evolved from animals, there's always an animalistic nature within us. This animalistic nature might be seen as the root cause of the terrible crimes inflicted by the group on Adam in the first place. Adam's name is also significant. In the biblical creation account of Genesis, God created a perfect world free from death and pain and suffering of every kind. He formed a beautiful garden where he placed Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned, causing widespread chaos and destruction. In DNA, we see something similar. Just as Adam and Eve's sin in the idyllic Garden of Eden caused destruction, the character's own savage nature brings about the same. Despite being in the woods, which could perhaps be home to dangerous creatures, the danger is found within the children themselves. Kelly's choice to call the victim Adam can be seen as a reference to the Bible's account of the cause of human savagery or sin. And so, in Adam, we see two contrasting ideas about the cause of human savagery. His animalistic behaviour suggests a devolution into a primitive state, whilst his name references the biblical teaching on original sin. Kathy In our analysis of Phil, we explored his cold indifference to the events of the play. Kathy, on the other hand, takes great pleasure and delight in the sinister happenings. In Act 1, Kathy's response to the news of Adam's death is, it's quite exciting and better than ordinary life. Kathy willingly follows Phil's initial plan, asking only for clarification on the details such as which one's south. Her unquestioning willingness contrasts Danny, who asks, is he taking the piss? And Richard, who complains, me, but I hate him. In Act 2, Kathy is excited at the prospect of being interviewed and the chance to get on the telly. She enthuses, they might even give me money for it. In the same scene, we learn that it was Kathy who deliberately chose someone matching the made-up description to plant the DNA on. I thought, you know, show initiative. Kathy shows no remorse for framing an innocent man for a crime he did not commit. In Act 3, Kathy explains, I used violence to get Adam out of the hedge, saying, I threatened to gouge one of his eyes out. She tells Brian, if you don't shut up, you'll be dead. When Phil chooses her to kill Adam for real, she's happy to do so, again following his directions without resistance. Kathy seems to have learned from John Tate and Phil that she can use violence and threats to get people to do what she wants. 
We learn in the final scene that Kathy has taken charge and is now running things. Richard explains that she is insane she cut a first year's finger off. Kathy then has filled the void left by Phil and taken the position of leader, seemingly by force. We've already looked at how Phil can be classed as a psychopath. Kathy, on the other hand, might be viewed as sadistic, actually taking pleasure in the suffering of others. Dennis Kelly explained when I interviewed him, as an individual, I don't think there's many people on that stage in that play, probably with the exception of Kathy, really, who finds out that she's probably a psychopath, and that's a sort of career calling for her. But with the exception of Kathy, I don't think there's anyone that really wanted any of that stuff to happen. This is a fascinating quotation to Kelly. Kathy is the only one who wanted the events of the play to take place, and it explains why, when the danger is over, she's still cutting off fingers and leading a savage life. 